I'm Adam Richardson, and this is the Writer's Detective Bureau. Welcome to episode 139 of the Writer's Detective Bureau, the podcast dedicated to helping authors and screenwriters write professional crime fiction. And this week, we're talking about cybercrime investigations, trap and trace, and which holster an undercover character might choose in hot weather. This week's first question comes from Sophia, who asks, how does a detective go about investigating cybercrime? All the devices have been collected from the company, but what to do next is where I'm stuck. What should a cybercriminal investigator do next? Thanks for the question, Sophia. It really depends on the sort of cybercrime that we're talking about here. Is this a hacking? Is it a fraud? Is this a theft of intellectual property, or is it a ransomware lockout? When we collect devices from a company, we obviously bag and label everything. Even if it's as simple as a single PC, we label every cable at each end and at each port. So if the mouse was connected to a USB port on the back of the CPU, the end of the mouse cable might be labeled with the letter A. And the USB port it was plugged into is also labeled the letter A. This way we can recreate the setup precisely. Now, imagine doing this to an entire server room with thousands of cables. It can get quite tedious quite quickly. Next, for any devices that we'll need to search, which will require a search warrant, by the way, your cybercrime investigator will create an image of the hard drive. This is an exact copy of the hard drive, and this is the copy we will use to do our own searches on. If we're looking for a certain kind of file, whether that's an executable file that a hacker might have installed to gain access to the system, or a certain type of picture that is illegal to possess, those searches happen using a computer forensic search program, something like Encase, E-N-C-A-S-E, that is one brand. Um, Again, that search is done using that kind of software on that image or that copy of the hard drive. And we do this to preserve the original hard drive as best evidence. Um, Check out episode 116 to learn more about the technical stuff like this, um, like making a hash. Uh, And no, I'm not talking about potatoes or concentrated marijuana. (laughs) If the cybercrime you're writing about relates to searching hard drives. So check out 116. If it's more of a hacking of a network kind of thing, I imagine your investigator will be looking at network logs and traffic data and looking for patterns. Honestly, despite having been a member of the High Technology Crime Investigation Association for many years, um, that is going to be outside of my realm of expertise. I'm sure there are podcasts on this. Um, But check out the HTCIA. Uh, It's a networking group that your cybercrime investigator will likely rely upon to find expert help that he or she may need. In the computer forensics world, at least in the law enforcement computer forensics world, it's a pretty tight knit group and they work with each other. And I mean, detectives from different police departments uh, work with each other, help each other on cases all the time. Ultimately, though, someone on the investigation team will need to interview the company employees to learn more about whatever kind of incident this is. And hopefully this will lead to some sort of actionable lead, like one of the employees may have clicked on what turned out to be a phishing email, or one of the employees might recall a weird phone call that may have been social engineering. These interviews may or not be conducted by your same investigator doing the computer forensic work, but they will both be key players in the investigation. But that's totally up to you as the creator of the story. I hope this helps a little bit. I know um, it's not the best answer, but it's the best I can do (laughs) given my expertise. But I do recommend checking out the HTCIA at htcia.org to learn more about police detectives that work in cybercrime. My friend and author, Sharon P. Lynn, asks, Hi, Adam. I'm working on a story with a person who has been missing for several years. A relative gets a phone call with no message, but can hear the phone disconnecting abruptly. The relative is convinced the missing person is trying to get in touch. Would local police consider tapping the relative's phone? Would it be legal? 
I haven't decided yet on the setting, but it will either be Northern Illinois or Southern Wisconsin if that makes any difference legally. Thanks. Hope you're enjoying retirement. Thanks for the question, Sharon. And yes, I definitely am enjoying retirement. Uh, The short answer is no, they would not consider a wiretap of the phone, but there is one thing they might consider doing with the phone. So we're going to do a bit of a deep dive on the phone stuff right now, because there's more to phones than just wiretaps. Let's start with understanding what a wiretap is and is not. Wiretap is the legal interception of electronic communications in real time. That means listening in on live phone calls, seeing text messages in real time, or receiving pager type messages in real time in case you're writing a story set in the 1990s. The courts have held that this kind of real time listening in or reading in, as the case may be, to be the most intrusive type of search that law enforcement can do. We've talked about wiretaps before on the podcast in episodes 68 and 81. And we talked about bugging a room in episode 125, which is a completely different kind of um, electronic eavesdropping. So I'm not going to rehash all the technical stuff here for that. I will say that to get a wiretap order signed by a judge, you need more than just probable cause. If you want to learn more about what your characters might need to do to get a wiretap, then check out those episodes. That was episode 68 and 81. Uh, and then listen out for the term exhaustion argument. That's going to be a key part. The point here being that getting a wiretap takes a lot more work and money than just getting a search warrant signed because there are protections to our privacy that prevent law enforcement from getting wiretaps without significant justification. So where are we going with all this? When we get a wiretap up and running on a target phone, the wiretap or intercept order is just the listening in part. If I'm an investigator sitting in a wire room, which ironically is exactly where I was when I watched season one of HBO's The Wire on DVD back in the day, what else might I need to know when I'm listening in on phone calls? We need to know who our target is calling, right? And we need to know who is calling our target. Those two things are provided by two separate tools, tools that are separate from the wiretap itself. And those are things that you ask for when you get a wiretap order signed, But those are also things you can get without the wiretap order. So let me explain. To find out the numbers a phone is dialing out to. So if we still imagine ourselves sitting in a wire room listening to our bad guy make a phone call. And let's say, as we imagine this, it's the early 1990s and most of the phones are still wired landlines. Our bad guy picks up his handset. He hears a dial tone. And then we hear him push the touch tone DTMF, that dual tone multi-frequency buttons on his phone to dial out. In our wire room, we have a little box that gives us a readout of those numbers that were dialed. That little box is called a pen register. Fast forward to today, that little box is now part of a program on a computer, but it's something we can still use a court order to have the phone company provide us. In a modern wire room, the outgoing number would appear on the computer screen that we're using to also digitally listen in on the phone call with. Similarly, when a call comes into our bad guy from someone else, the phone company provides us with a different service called Trap and Trace. This is essentially court-ordered caller ID, at least as far as trapping the phone number that was calling into our target. It's worth mentioning that when I worked in a wire room, Pen registers and trap and trace did not provide the subscriber info, meaning the name and address of the account holder on that phone, automatically. That was something we had to obtain from the phone company separately, again, using an order signed by a judge. But trap and trace was a service that could be provided by the phone company. In California, we have the misdemeanor crime of annoying phone calls, which is Penal Code Section 653M, M like Mary. So if I had a 653M victim that was getting hang-up calls or a creepy dude calling over and over again, the victim could ask the phone company to set up a trap and trace and provide the report number for our 653M investigation, like the police case number. The phone company would then start logging all of the phone numbers that called our victim for a certain period, usually a billing cycle of 30 days or so. Then we'd have the victim keep track of the dates and times when those annoying phone calls came in. 
At the end of the trap and trace period, I, as the detective, would have to reach out to the phone company and get the records that related to the dates and times of the annoying calls. Now, it's been 25 years since I've worked a 653M case, so I'd bet good money that the phone company now requires either a search warrant or, at the very least, a formal request on police department letterhead, as well as a copy of the official police report to release those records. But this is exactly what I would have your detective and relative do in your scenario, Sharon. Now, in real life, it would take more than two hang-up phone calls, but after the third or fourth, I'd say your story could get away with the phone company starting a trap and trace on the relative's phone line. If you want to learn more about wiretap, pen register, and trap and trace laws, I will include research resources in the show notes, which you can find at writersdetective.com forward slash 139. L.A. Selby asked this in the Cops and Writers Facebook group, which is administered by my good friend Patrick O'Donnell. I'm an admin in there as well. Plus, we have our own Writers Detective Q&A Facebook group. So if you are new to all of this, you have resources on Facebook you can reach out to to get answers to your questions separate from submitting to the podcast. But definitely check out the Cops and Writers Facebook group and the Writers Detective Q&A group. Anyway, L.A. Selby asked, For a modern-day detective who is undercover, working in a very hot environment like Florida in the summer, where short sleeves and shorts and sandals or boat shoes would be the normal-looking clothes in the area, where would they carry a gun on their person? It's been a thousand years since I watched Miami Vice. (laughs) Many thanks. So I replied with the following. The best concealed carry holster I ever owned was a thin piece of folded-over leather with a clip. The Model 6 holster made by Bianchi. I wore it daily on surveillance and on most undercover ops. My first one lasted 10 years with daily use. I replaced it with an identical one that lasted another 10 years. I had zero issues wearing it with jeans or shorts, and I was one of the few in my unit that carried the full-size duty weapon rather than a compact or subcompact. And then I also added that I always carried in the 5 o'clock position with an inside the waistband or IWB holster. There are a few ops where I was unarmed, but I had a whole van of middle-aged mutant ninja turtles listening to my wire and ready to pounce if things went south. Some departments are very strict, in which firearms the officers and detectives are allowed to carry. And while other departments allow their officers and detectives quite a bit of leeway to include being allowed to carry personally owned weapons on duty, each department is different and it's always guided by a written policy. As for where your character might carry his or her firearm, it would likely remain on their person and carried in a holster inside their waistband. Like I mentioned, I carry in the five o'clock position, but a lot of detectives use an appendix carry. So if you imagine the button on your shorts or pants is the 12 o'clock position, appendix carry would be around the two o'clock position, you know, right over your appendix. Uh, Your character would just keep their shirt untucked. Of course, this isn't the most comfortable carry position, especially if you're like me carrying a few extra pounds, but it's what the cool kids are doing. I personally like the five o'clock position because it's very close to where I would naturally reach if I needed my gun. And by naturally reach, I mean for all the thousands of hours of training where I was shooting with a gun belt on. I'm going to react to a threat by reaching to my right side and not having to think about where my gun is located today. Like, am I wearing it appendix carry? Is it under my left armpit in a shoulder holster? Is it on my ankle? Nope. It is always on my right hand side. Like always, just maybe a bit further back than where I would have it if I had my gun belt on. Also, when it's in the five o'clock position, I can reach it with my left hand behind my back if I really need to. But how your character carries his or her firearm is going to be up to their personal preference. You can check out a bunch of different everyday carry holsters by going to safariland.com and clicking on their EDC section under the holsters tab. And since I've retired the leather flap holster, now that I've gone to a SIG P365XL with an optic, I carry the Safariland Schema IWB holster still in the five o'clock position whenever I'm back in the United States. So as I record this, I'm currently in Australia, staying with some friends just outside of Melbourne. And like many of my Aussie and English friends, guns aren't something the writers outside of the U.S. often have much hands-on experience with. 
If writing about the gun stuff feels outside of your comfort zone, let me quickly remind you that I have an online course called Crime Fiction Guns, designed specifically for fiction authors with zero experience with guns and ammo. If you'd like to feel confident including details about ammunition and firearms in your stories, check out writersdetective.com forward slash crime fiction guns to enroll in the course. So once again, writersdetective.com forward slash ask to send me your questions, no matter how small the question. And I'd also like to thank my Patreon patrons for sponsoring this episode, especially my gold shell patrons, Deborah Dunbar from DebraDunbar.com, CC Jameson from ccjameson.com, Larry Darter, Natalie Borelli, Craig Kingsman of craigkingsman.com, and Marco Carocari of marcocarocari.com for their support along with my Silver Cufflink and Coffee Club patrons. You can find links to all of the patrons supporting this episode in the show notes at writersdetective.com forward slash 139. Thanks again for listening. Have a great week and write well.